is to conjuring as James Joyce to the novel or Einstein to physics. It's a person who comes along about once a century and just changes everything because of something that, that, that he or she has brought to the table that suddenly just changes the way people approach that field. As a father, he was a good magician. We were dispossessed because he didn't believe in paying bills. It was not something he was interested in doing. So my mother had to scrimp and try to keep the family together while he practiced seconds. I don't think there's a performer today, today in, in Las Vegas or Hong Kong or China who doesn't have a little Dave Vernon in them. His contribution to magic is unparalleled. In the last hundred years, nobody was able to touch him. This is a tale of a magician and his magic. His life spanned almost a century, and during that time, he would transform this ancient art. Whether he was called David or Dale, Day or Die, everywhere he went, he was known as the Professor. He spent the last years of his life in this magic castle, a shadow-like private club for magicians. Here, Vernon was the undisputed wizard of wizards. Max Maven, no mean conjurer himself, knew the professor during the last decades of his life. This is where the professor would sit virtually every night. So correctly, I should be sitting either over there or over here, which is where I would sit and talk to him along with many others. This was where he held court. He made this the center of the magic universe, just as he made everywhere else he went the center of the magic universe. But this was not the first castle to play a role in the professor's life. His family lived almost in the shadow of Canada's stately parliament buildings, a comfortable middle-class family in a far-flung corner of the Dominion in the twilight of the Victorian era. He was going to follow a path that would scandalize the good citizens of that elegant time. David Frederick Wingfield Berner was born in 1894, the eldest of James and Helen Berner's three sons. David's father would occasionally entertain him with simple magic tricks, never dreaming of the destiny that awaited his young son. Young David loved to watch performances of any kind. But nothing was as exciting as the magicians. His love of magic was already drawing him into a world remote from respectable Ottawa. As soon as he could read, he devoured all the magic books in Ottawa's Carnegie Library. His almost supernatural talent was apparent from his earliest youth. In 1901, magician extraordinaire Howard Thurston came to Ottawa. Although Thurston was the self-proclaimed king of cards, the seven-year-old David Verner fooled him with a card trick. In 1902, eight-year-old David came under the spell of a book that had been published earlier that year. The expert at the card table purported to do something that no book had done before. It explained in detail the techniques of crooked gamblers, as well as magicians. People supposed that the book's author, S.W. Erdnays, was using a pseudonym. After all, he was revealing the closely guarded secrets of the criminal underworld, certainly a dangerous practice. Half a century later, a sordid tale would be pieced together that would lead many researchers to conclude that S.W. Erdnays was an anagram for the name of Milton Franklin Andrews, a thief and killer who met his fate in San Francisco, where cornered by the law, he shot his girlfriend and then killed himself. Despite its highly suspect origins, Erdnays has never gone out of print. But young David knew none of this. He only knew that Erdnays held the key to a world of conjuring he had never imagined. By 12, he had memorized the entire book. And over the next 80 years, he would continue to study this Bible and spread its gospel. When he began performing, 
for church and school groups. There were some who were less than pleased. When he started doing magic, his mother was upset because he was good at it. She said the other children, you know, they were they couldn't really sing or dance, but to David, you did so well. I'm so, so ashamed. <laughs> I said, Mother, what do you mean? She told you that she think you. I said, Mother, I did very well, I'm sure. He said, yes, but she said, everybody in the audience must have thought that you were not my child. You were, I picked you up at a circus. You were a circus child. In those days, if you belonged to a circus or show business, you were below the pale. On the other hand, David's interest in the fine arts probably received more support from his family. His uncle was Frederick Berner, a noted Canadian landscape painter. Berner's father always encouraged his interest in the arts. But for the moment, his parents' concern was that he have the best education they could afford. And so, young David was sent off to Ashbury College, even in those days, an exclusive Ontario private school. He was a well-rounded student, a fine artist, captain of the football team, a star hockey player. It was here that his chums shortened Dave to Day, the first of many transmutations his name would undergo. During a family vacation at Old Orchard Beach in Maine, it became clear that David had great artistic talents, although these seemed to favor unusual forms of expression. One day, he came across a silhouette cutter plying his trade on the pier. It was a popular art form, but a difficult skill. There were few artists in the country who did it professionally. David couldn't wait to try. So I went back to the Old Orchard House, and I took a pair of scissors, and I tried to cut a silhouette like I'd see this man do. And I cut two or three out of this piece of paper. And my father came home, he looked at it, and he said, you know, those pictures you've got there are, more, um, are in better proportion than the man on the pier. Recognizing his talents, in 1913, his parents agreed to his traveling to New York for art lessons. It was to be a journey into a very different world. New York was a city that had figured large in his dreams for as long as he could remember. His plan to live here as an art student changed as soon as he discovered Coney Island. Unlike today, a less seedy Coney Island was a popular playground for a middle class seeking a summer refuge. And it was here that he tried his hand at a trade that would prove the economic mainstay of the first half of his life. I was at Coney Island. That's where I met this Larry Gray, the Dizzy Wizard. He had a shop saying, learn to entertain. He said, what do you do down here? And I was, I just for fun, I said, I'm a silhouette artist. So that night I went home and I made a, a display. So I put them up at his magic store and I made $17. That was good money in those days. And I thought, boy, I can stay in Coney Island now for the season. But with the fading of summer, Vernon had to return home to Canada and the RMC, the Royal Military College. That Coney Island adventure was to stand in sharp contrast to the life of a cadet at RMC. Here, Vernon would specialize in engineering and once again excel in sports. The Great War brought the games to an end. In 1914, Vernon enlisted in the newly formed Air Force, but the fates intervened. He never saw combat, his much-needed drafting skills left him at home, behind a desk, dreaming of New York. By war's end, he had left Canada and moved to Manhattan. Then, as now, the bright lights of Broadway were an irresistible attraction for those in love with the stage. Vernon was no exception, but his real love was for one of the theater's less respected branches. This time, Vernon did not enroll for classes at the Art Students League. He had committed himself to another muse. And to his mother's chagrin, it was this craft that Vernon wanted to see elevated to the level of the higher arts. Whenever he could, he would make his way to one of the city's magic hangouts, sometimes to his friend Al Flosso's shop, which Al's son Jackie runs today. I'm going to show you a trick called squeeze play. Just come over like that. Huck a tuck it right on top. Then I'm just going to show my hands empty and then you just squeeze it right through. 
because see if it went through, you'd be the judge. Unbelievable. And it doesn't sell for much money at all. Any would-be magician could drop in and buy the latest trick, but only the inner circle had access to the back room, and then only after having proved their worth. These back rooms were the meeting places of legendary masters, Al Flosso, whose brand of comedy magic gave him the name the Coney Island Fakir, Horace Golden, the whirlwind wizard, who performed illusions of all kinds, Max Malini, who had performed before the crowned heads of Europe, and who, like the dapper Nate Leipzig, created magic with only cards, coins, and the most commonplace objects. In the back rooms, the inner circle shared their secrets. But even the best of these gaped in astonishment when the young Canadian began to work. After his very first demonstration, he was invited into the inner sanctum. When he came to New York, he was doing things from Erdnays that the card people in New York who knew cards, but they didn't know about this, he was fooling them with this, with, with Erdnays approaches. And to this day, if you could do what's in Erdnays, you were a top card man. Vernon may have been known to the inner circle, but in the public imagination, Harry Houdini was the embodiment of magic. Vernon didn't share the public's enthusiasm. While he might begrudgingly give a nod to Houdini's public relations abilities, or to his skills as an escape artist, he did not speak highly of him as a magician. Vernon had very strong ideas about what counted as magic and what didn't. Anything mysterious is magic, something that people can't explain, something weird happens, something strange. There's nothing strange to seeing a guy get out of a straitjacket. He wiggles around, tries, and gets the thing out of her. Houdini wasn't, didn't do any magic. He didn't do, he did escapes and, and, and put his name across. He didn't, he couldn't do magic. Houdini had issued a challenge. No one could fool him with a trick if he saw it three times. Vernon had Houdini write his name on a card. He then proceeded to fool him. Not once. Not three times. Seven times. in 1919, even before his career had begun, he assumed the mantle of the man who fooled Houdini. It wouldn't be long before everyone in the magic scene was calling this young man the professor. Coney Island today no longer looms as large as it did for so much of Vernon's early life. Having first enticed Vernon to stay in New York, Coney Island was now about to play the role of matchmaker for the expatriate Canadian. The renowned magician Horace Golden was performing at Coney Island. In theaters around the world, he had caused women to float in the air, had made them vanish, and was one of the first to saw them in half. One of his assistants at Coney Island was the comely Jean Hayes, soon to be Mrs. David Vernon. On March the 5th, 1924, they were married at Manhattan's Church of the Transfiguration, known to the New York art scene as the little church around the corner. Jean and David seemed to have a lot in common, but their life together was not to prove harmonious. I think she was kind of the black sheep of her family. She ran away from home. She was fairly gifted as an artist. She was a sculptress, and she didn't think she was a painter, but I thought she did pretty well as a painter. Like her husband, Jean's talents expressed themselves in unusual ways. Among other things, she made masks. Some were used in performances by Vernon and other magicians, not her favorite group of people. She didn't care much for magic or magic. She liked a number of people, but magicians in general, she had absolutely no use for. She says, they're all out to fool people. That's all I want was fool people, fool people. So she could be hell on wheels sometimes. In 1926, their first son, Edward, was born. Six years later, he'd have a younger brother, Derek. This time of familial bliss was heralded by a measure of financial success that in 1924 was almost magically thrust upon him. 
While casually performing card tricks for some friends, Vernon was approached by the well-known theatrical agent, Francis Rockefeller King. And she said, I'll give you $5,000. She said, for the, that's what she told me, $5,000 for a month's work. And then anyway, I worked for her for 10 or 12 years after that. All the magicians in New York were very jealous because they were getting 25. My minimum salary was $100, and sometimes I got as much as 300 for a single performance. But I only worked for the Astors and the Vanderbilts and the Schwabs and multimillionaires because she had that kind of a clientele. But even that privileged realm would be rocked when in 1929 the stock market crashed and the world was swallowed by the Great Depression. Throughout those lean years of soup lines and work projects, Vernon found he could still make a living with his shears and a sheet of black paper. His clientele included the writer F. Scott Fitzgerald, the actor Ray Bolger, and even a president. But it was the art and craft of deception that was his passion. Everything else just got in the way. I remember him coming home with something new and then sitting there and practicing it completely day after day and sometimes completely through the night. I came home one day from school and of course I was so young it didn't make any difference to me. I thought it was great fun. All our furniture was out in the street because when the landlord would come my father would say, tell him to go to hell. He wasn't a very good tenant and perhaps an even less accomplished father. My father was very unusual as a parent. He wasn't a typical parent. If, if I were doing a magic trick or watching a magic trick, I don't think he was aware that I existed. I remember we had a big swimming meet in uh, New York through the Madison Square Boys Club. And I was only a little guy. And I came out third in the city, and I was proud of myself. And my father said, don't you ever have me come down and watch you do anything if you don't come in first. He may have seemed insensitive to domestic responsibilities, but there was one thing guaranteed to get his attention. Word of a gambler with a new technique. In the early 30s, Vernon and Charlie Miller who I believe were the two greatest sleight of hand artists in America at that time, received phone calls from a mutual friend. And this fellow said, there's a man in Wichita, Kansas, who can deal from the center of the deck. In the old books, anybody who's read magical literature, there's no reference to a center deal. There's no such thing as somebody says, it's hard enough to deal a second card. How in the world are you gonna deal a card from the center of the deck? And these two men hung up the phones and packed their bags and left for Wichita. The question is, why did two grown men travel so fast and so far? To understand why, you have to consider that a talented cheat might be able to control the position of the cards after a shuffle. But in most games, another player will then cut the deck. And somehow, the cheat has to regain control of the cards after the cut. Vernon and Miller searched everywhere for Alan Kennedy of Kansas City, who, rumor had it, could accomplish this impossible slight. They went to gambling joints, to poker rooms, to pool parlors, even bowling alleys. They were unable to find Alan Kennedy. They just couldn't find him. And in frustration, they were packing up their bags to go home. And Vernon noticed a little girl uh, eating an ice cream cone in front of a store. And I said, do you know a Mr. Kennedy in town? And she said, Mr. Kennedy lives in that white house at the top of the hill. And that's how they found Kennedy and actually saw the center deal. And Vernon used to love to tell this story when he was in his 80s. He'd always kind of lean back and say, I'm not a Bible student, but I thought a little child shall lead them. I thought, yeah. I've been looking all around, yeah. Charlie Miller and I, and banks and filling stations, and here's a little child. And so in 1931, they discovered this holy grail of card cheats. They found it on the outskirts of Kansas City in the hands of a farmer who could absolutely, imperceptibly deal the cards he wanted from the center of a shuffled deck.
This is an effect that we call a 10 count, which I had learned from Dave. And, and I'll show it to you. Let me show you. Look. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Vernon created magic of all kinds, but it was miracles with cards which more than anything else made Vernon's reputation. And by the early 1930s, he was known throughout the magical underground. His first serious publication was this manuscript, a few scant pages, only ten effects with cards. And yet, during the Depression, it was offered for sale at the extraordinary price of $20, the equivalent of about $1,000 today. Even more extraordinary, at that price, it quickly sold out. The Second World War found him too old for active service, but it was to bring him closer to the battlefield than he'd come during World War I. Vernon joined the American Service Wing, an entertainment organization like the USO. He was made a captain and put in charge of a group who performed for troops stationed in the Philippines. In civilian life, Vernon continued developing a number of acts, combining sophisticated magic with costumes, makeup, and masks. In 1943, his wife Jean was busy making sketches for his newest and most ambitious act yet. He would be the Harlequin. Jean would play the assistant. Even there, he didn't do illusions. He still did sleight of hand. He to produce a coconut and throw it up in the air and it would turn into a monkey and he'd take off his gloves and throw them up and it would be a dove. It was all done to classical music. It was a kind of a different approach to magic in those days. And actually the magicians went crazy when they saw it. It was, he got a tremendous standing ovation. And he immediately got booked at Radio City Music Hall. Unfortunately, they tried in the first show, they tried in the second. Now you gotta remember the Radio City Music Hall had 6,200 seats. That's a big theater, isn't it, for magic. Well, they tried their best to light him. They went up to the mezzanine, the producers, they went up to the balcony, the orchestra. They couldn't, the people couldn't see many of the props. And they, I don't think he, he just about finished the next day and they closed them out. And he was very heart sick about that. Although the act played well in the smaller yet elegant Rainbow Room, Vernon was deeply disappointed. While he continued to be in demand for society parties, and his love of magic never diminished, it was becoming clear that he really didn't like performing. For the first time, Vernon harbored doubts about his destiny. The consequences were disastrous. If things come in threes, I got a chance to play vaudeville, to play, to play several weeks in theaters. I got a chance to go to Norfolk, Virginia to cut silhouettes for the Junior League. And I also got a chance to use my engineering job that I took at RMC. So I asked my wife, I said, what should I do, Gene? Will I cut the silhouettes or take the theater job or, or use the engineering job? They're built in the East River Parkway, and I can get a job there, a pretty good job. My wife says, you've never worked in your life. Why don't you take a man's job and go to work like a, like a man, you know? And he was supposed to sit on a barge in the East River and do nothing. But he wanted to help, and he was carrying buckets of mercury from the barge to the, the dock, and the plank broke, and he fell down between the barge, and they broke both his arms very badly. And they wanted to cut his arm off, and he wouldn't let him. And they said, well, it's damaged beyond repair. It was his elbow. Just smashed all the hell. And I said, we can't fix it. And he said, well, you're not cutting it off. He said, it's my life. To his doctor's surprise, Vernon recovered, but he would never again be able to fully straighten his arms. Some of his friends said it was a lesson not to be forgotten. John Scarney, he was a very good card man. He came into the hospital and he says, just goes to show you that guys like you and me shouldn't work. That's what he said. <laughs> it wasn't long before he was performing again. During the next few years, he would work the cruise ships of the Caribbean, a performing venue that, like upscale Manhattan society, suited his aristocratic tastes and personal style. Given a choice, though, he would still rather hang out with magicians and gamblers and by the mid-1940s, there was no shortage of men who would drive across the state to have a chance to listen to Vernon. The 46th lecture was the start of what we 
gotten to know as magic lectures. But to me, when they did those lectures, I was there with my friend, and we were just astounded by what we saw. I mean, our mouths were open, or, you know, just amazing, and these were things we had never seen before. And the approach, and I will tell you honestly, and very honestly, that changed my whole thinking and approach to magic. His, his drive was for naturalness in magic. No, no, no fancy moves, but every move had a reason. And one of the things that was so good about his uh, magic was that it didn't look like magic. It just... Th magical things happen, but he wasn't, he wasn't making passes or doing any, any, any weird things. The professor was an aristocrat, and aristocrats do not show off. He taught the magician John Carney that magic meant naturalness, and naturalness meant disguising, not exhibiting your skill. If I were to take a, a card like the Ace of Clubs and cut it into the pack like that, you might be impressed if I shake the cards and it came to the top, you'd go, wow, that's really fast, that's really clever, that's really skillful. But that's not the impression that the professor was going for. He would much rather have an impression like this, where I bent the card and I show you the, the card bent, and it's going into the pack, you can see it bent there. It's much more impressive if, if it looks like you do nothing at all. and the card still comes up to the top. That's different, that's magic. Vernon's genius was sometimes in creating something from whole cloth, from scratch, but, but sometimes, frequently, his genius was knowing what to put in and what to take out and how to put it together. As an example of this, when Di Vernon published his cup and ball routine, it became the cup and ball routine. So much so that if you see a magician perform the cups and balls anywhere in the world, the odds of it being essentially the Vernon routine are 90 plus percent. That's an amazing thing to have that strong an influence, to create the template. The Vernon touch was to spread far beyond North America in the mid-1950s, he was invited to lecture in England. As in New York, the lectures were enthusiastically received. But more than that, they were occasions when the best and brightest gathered around Vernon to create a whirlwind of magical activity. It was a time that culminated in his being recognized by England's prestigious magic circle and in the publication of a much-anticipated book. The professor's magical star had risen, but in his personal life, all was not well. Unfortunately, living with my father as a wife would have, would have been impossible for almost anybody. I mean, he was very much a gentleman, he was kind, but he was just totally unconcerned with anything that didn't deal with his specific little world. She, you know, got to drink a little too much, and it was all because he was so removed from it all. I mean, he would never worry about things the rents do or something. I mean, he, he wouldn't even think about it, and of course it drove her crazy. And one night my mother was drinking and had cooked some exotic dish, and I went turned up my nose at it. And being tiny, she would pick up whatever she could pick up and, and to whack the kids with, and she happened to pick up this Japanese bayonet and proceeded to whack me up pretty good, where I had hundreds of stitches and slashed... And I remember we had a railroad flat, which is a row of rooms in a row. And my brother and my father were in the front room playing chess. And I ran screaming from the back bedroom where she was hacking me up into the front room and said, stop her, stop her, she's killing me. And my father turned like this and went back and said, check. <laughs> Throughout the 1950s, the tensions in the Vernon household would only get worse. Jean and David would eventually go their separate ways. They would never divorce but he would never see her again. If you want to be in Pi, you have to have done something your first time. This lecture by Dr. Percy Diaconis at the University of California deals with an unusual subject, a subject most would not imagine part of the university's curriculum, the mathematics of cards and shuffling. Okay, well, he cuts the top half. That's, say, one up to 26, if he happened to cut exactly in half. It's whatever is in the top half, right? Thank you.
In the late 1950s, Dr. Diaconis was a young boy studying violin at New York's famed Juilliard School of Music. But he lived for the time he would spend at the shops and restaurants where the magicians met to exchange the latest tricks and gossip. He was one of the young kids hanging around with the big guys. Vernon was the sun around which the others revolved. You sat at Vernon's table by invitation only. I was practicing, dealing the second card instead of the top one, and somebody said behind me, oh, that's very good, and I know who your teacher was, and I looked up and it was Vernon, and I thought, oh my God, you know, but I sort of hung tough, and I said, well, what do you mean? And he said, no, no, you, you learned from Francis Carlyle, that's, that's very good, you do do that again, you do that very well, and it was just the two of us, and, and he was sincere, I mean, and, and uh, and then later, when the place filled up, he called me over to the big guy's table and uh, said, now do that, what I saw you do before. And I, I did my little number, and, and he said, now, you know, this young man has only been doing this for a few years, and he can do that better than any of you guys. And there really is something to learn about that. Why do you think that is? You know, and, and I was burning red, and he said, from now on, you can sit with us. Perhaps Vernon recognized something of himself in Percy. At an early age, they had both devoted themselves to Erdnays, the expert at the card table. It had a fascination for me, no way to explain it, and so I thought I knew it pretty well, and Vernon knew it line by line, like the Bible, and uh, he would sort of quiz me and endlessly. Um, how many one-handed moves are there in Erdnays, or... You know, where does Erdnays talk about overcoming friction with the nail and et cetera? And one day he called me up and said, I'm going to Delaware tomorrow. Do you want to go? And I said, tomorrow? And I was 14. And he said, yeah. And I said, I'd love to go. Percy Diaconis and Vernon would spend almost the next two years traveling around the country, attending magic conventions, and chasing down rumors of gamblers with new techniques. If we heard that an Eskimo had some way of healing the second card, we would be off to Alaska to go see if we could track them down. He just followed the wind. It was a boy's dream come true, certainly. I guess some eyebrows were raised. Uh, it's hard for people to understand the attraction of a great magic trick. <laughs> Percy, like others who had lived with Vernon, found it almost as difficult as Jean had. We were visiting some magician and they had cream de cocoa and would I like some cream de cocoa? And I, I said I didn't like alcohol. And Vernon said, no, no, I'll try that. You'll like it. It's like chocolate milk. It's just, it's terrific. And um, and I said, I, I, no, thank you. And and uh, he said, no, come on. If, if, whatever happens, you try it and, you know, I'll show you that double lift or whatever it was, some slight that, that, that he'd been torturing me with. And so, oh, okay. So I tasted this stuff, and, uh, uh, and it, my reaction is, it was awful, it tastes like liquor, and I put it down, and he said, I knew you'd done that, if you just hadn't done that, I would have showed you, now I'll never show that to you, and, uh, well, so, I mean, that, that went on, so I think at the end of the period when I was living with Vernon, we were screaming at each other a fair amount of the time, sort of like an old married couple. And yet they would remain friends for the rest of Vernon's life. But after two years together, they'd had enough of each other for the moment. Percy headed back east to practice his craft, and eventually to Harvard. Vernon went west to Hollywood and the Magic Castle. Vernon had come for a visit to check out this private club for magicians, and then decided to stay. Anytime you walked into the Magic Castle in the first half of a, of a given night, you were almost certain to see him. Sometimes it felt like he never left. His presence made this place important, and it made it come alive. Magicians made their way here from all over to spend time with Vernon. Some of them would become stars in their own right, including another Canadian, Doug Henning. But all of them came to pay homage to the professor. Vernon made pilgrims, happy pilgrims of us all. That he literally had the power to make people get up and move. That's amazingly powerful. We must have all felt that at some particular point there was no choice. This is what we must do, and this is what we did. This is one of those trick coins that split in two. You're probably familiar with those. You know, right? 
Uh, so that's uh, John long. Kearney came from the Midwest to hone his craft under the eye of the master. That's three coins, and that one. Mi oh, that's not a coin. Ah, there it is, right there. That's four coins. So that's one, two, three, four. I would show him things what, at the Magic Castle over a drink or something, and he would nitpick, and he would criticize things and tear it apart. And uh, you would think that would be a bad thing, but you'd take it home and uh, come back the next day with some changes, and he'd still tear it apart, take it home, and eventually he'd run out of things to criticize. Steve Freeman came from Oklahoma. And while the public may not know his name, in Magic's inner circle he is spoken of as one of the finest card men in the world. And he made you work for the information. It didn't, it didn't come easily. Uh, the interesting thing is you could show him something that you really thought you knew well and thought you did well, and he would ask you several questions about it that pretty much made you realize you didn't understand the move at all. He certainly could tease, but he also had a real sense of humor and loved poking fun at himself and his own no-doubt well-earned reputation for being cantankerous. Someone showed him a trick that he'd been working on for many, many years and had perfected and asked him what he thought, and he said, That is the worst trick I have ever seen. That is absolutely terrible. You're the worst. No, no. Wait a minute. You're the second worst magician I ever met in my entire life. Get out of magic. Go sell shoes. Go do something. And the guy is all upset and he, he grabs the, the paraphernalia and he goes running up the stairs to the dining room and, and uh, Vernon turns to people at the table and says, you know the trouble with that guy? He can't take criticism. With Vernon enthroned at the castle, California became, as New York had been, the axis of the magical universe. Many of the New York friends were not pleased to see him go, and this added to the East-West rivalry. And one of the ways this rivalry expressed itself had to do with the pronunciation of his name, because all during the years that he was based in New York, his friends and, and people around him pronounced his first name Day. And when he moved to California, the pronunciation shifted to die. And there were sometimes uh, moments of almost friction on, on the issue of pronunciation. So not surprisingly, many people would ask him, what's the correct pronunciation, day or die? And he would smile and say, either or either. Okay, you say you're interested in a mind dream trick. Is yeah. that it? You yeah. want to read someone's <laughs> mind. That's, that's what you like to do. Okay. Uh, Vernon invented the modern notion of, of what I call think a card. So um, card tricks are often somebody says, well, take a card or something like that. And Vernon had, had a different tack. He would, he would say, think of a card. Okay, let's try it with this. I want you to look at any one of these cards and think of it. Got it. Are you thinking yeah, of one got card? It. Okay. And you think of one, and then somehow a card's laid down on your hand. You haven't said a word, and then what was the card you're thinking of? Jack of Hearts, and you turn it over, and it's the Jack of Hearts. It's just eerie. I want to see if I can get you, and I think I got you. I think I got you. What was the name of the card that you looked at? The Jack of Hearts. The Jack of Hearts. Did I get you? Because That's here so. is the Jack of Hearts. Vernon's importance for magic is as much for his connection to the past as for his creative contribution. His books and lectures made him an important bridge to times gone by and to the great magicians he so admired. That did not necessarily mean that the old masters felt the same way about him. They really were furious at Vernon. He took their best material and some of it's woven into his, his own always with stuff added or with just some kernel taken out. I met Lila Leipzig, um, who was Leipzig's widow, and when she knew that I was Vernon's student or acolyte or whatever I was, she refused to talk to me for quite a while. And she said, that Vernon is up to no good. You know, he just wants my Nate's secrets. And Leipzig was dead 20 years. But on the other hand, looking at it in retrospect, you know, much of that beautiful magic only lives today because Vernon saw it and appreciated it. Leipzig, Molini, again, annoyed as they would be, they come to life today because of Vernon.
For the next two decades, Dai continued holding court at the castle. During that time, he toured the world from Detroit to Japan. Till well into his 90s, Vernon was chatting and lecturing, demonstrating and joking, the crowned king of magic. At the age of 96, he broke his hip. His eldest son, Edward, took him home to care for him. He didn't do much. I mean, he would look at an Erdnay's book for a half hour and then just doze off. He would brighten up when the magicians would come, though. He would sit up in bed and they'd show him things and, you know, the latest thing they're working on and everything, and he'd comment on it and everything. That, he would brighten up a little bit then. Two years after his death in 1992, his friends in New York held a hundredth birthday for this man who had meant so much to them. He was the most dedicated or monomaniacal person I ever knew. He was brilliant. He was an intelligent man. He was a gifted artist. He did lettering, graphics, all kinds of things. But he devoted himself to one thing and one thing only. I'll tell you what I think the single most important thing about Di Vernon's influence on magic is. It was an attitude. To me, the great tragedy of 20th century magic in the larger picture is that magicians have taken... Uh, an art form that is inherently profound and rendered it trivial. And Di Vernon, it was never trivial with him. And I think that allowed at least a core part of the magic community to understand that and to approach magic with a sense of profundity, a sense of reverence, a sense of respect. And this spread so much so that I feel that there is Vernon present in the performance of every good magician on the face of this earth, it has just filtered out that universally. No one gave magic that much thought. He gave it concentration of thought. What he did was improve upon the classics and made them brilliant. In the last hundred years, nobody was able to touch them. Not only for sleight of hand, but for presentation, for the saw trick, for the linking rings, for the cups and balls. It, it, that was the you best. You cover that one, and cover the center one to make sure they're covered. I'm going to explain how this is done, but I'm going to simplify it so you can understand it. I'll put one of these back in my pocket, and I'll put this one back in my pocket. So if I put these two away, that leaves one under the center cup, doesn't it? There's one there. But you see, this one has returned again. Now, the reason for that is this. You were probably watching the wrong hand. When I told you I'd put it in my pocket, I have nothing here. I keep the ball here. I only pretend to put it in my pocket. Now I bring it down with my little finger, and I tilt the cup and put it underneath the cup. But if I actually put it in my pocket, how many are there under the center cup? You haven't been watching. There's three there. Don't be afraid to get it. <laughs> now, look, there's three. See, if I put all three away, put all three away, now how many under the center cup? Probably 20. No, there's only one. <laughs> and there's one here, and there's one here. Uh, he was somebody who couldn't have cared less where you came from, what you looked like, what your religion was. If you were seriously interested in magic, and he made one of those judgments that you were, that was it. He just gave you this remarkable gift of his company and his presence and his friendship. And what's equally remarkable and profoundly sad is that no people coming up again will ever be able to know him. Larry Gray who lived with Vernon for a couple of years and somebody asked him what was it like to know Vernon, what was it like to live with him and, and uh, he said, well let me tell you, you know, I wouldn't take a million dollars not to have known him, but I'd give a million not to know another like him.